welcome to this remote control basics video. In this video we're going to talk about remote control radios and more specifically the controls, why they're where they are and also how the channels got their names. For those of us that have been in remote control for a while this is second nature and it all just makes sense because it's part of the hobby that we know and understand. But for a lot of new people coming into the hobby it's confusing and particularly for those that are coming straight into multi-rotors some of the naming and conventions don't seem to make any sense. So because I've been asked about that a couple of times over the past weeks, I'm actually going to put this video together to hopefully explain to those subscribers how this happened, but also to explain to those people who are coming into the hobby who are new to remote control and going straight into the exciting world of multi-rotors a little bit more about some of the history and also to explain how some of these names came about. No matter what kind of radio you have, you will find that there is at least these basic controls. We have two movable sticks and there are different modes. This is a classic mode two where the throttle is on the left hand side. The rudder is on the same control as the throttle and then we have elevator and aileron. Now don't worry about that, we'll explain what these controls are, how they got their names and what they actually do in a minute. In addition to those movements and sticks we also have these things around the outside of the controls and these are called the trims. Now these were originally invented to just adjust the midpoints of the channels and what I mean by that is if you had a plane and you started to fly it and noticed that it was always tilting to the right you could use the trim to just trim that tendency out so it flew straight and level. So the control inputs that you were putting into the plane were actually moving it not to correct any drift or trim problems. So these trims were here on each side and correspond to the movement on each of the sticks. In addition, there was usually one or two additional switches on the shoulders. So as well as having the throttle, rudder, elevator and aileron, there was another one, typically called something like auxiliary one and two, or sometimes called things like gear. And that was a switch that you could flick and it would drop the gear. And the gear on a plane is obviously the wheels that would come out typically of the wings and maybe one in the nose or out the back of the plane as well. So by flicking that switch, that would activate the servo or servos on the plane and the wheels would drop, which is why it's called gear. So let's actually get a couple of slides up here and what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this radio. This is an old DX7 but one that I still use every day and we're going to use it with this great little Spitfire. Now this is a hobby zone Spitfire I'll put a link to it in the description. It's the only plane that's small enough to actually fit on the desk here to actually do the video. The others that I have tend to be a little bit bigger but what it is it's a full five channel plane so we'll be able to play with it and show you what each of these channels do. But before we get to that let's talk about a little bit about the remote control basics because if you're new to the hobby and you're interested in finding out a little bit more about how everything works it's worthwhile as going through a couple of slides. So the majority of the radios that you're going to come across in RC these days are going to be using one of the 2.4 gigahertz schemes. So that means that they're all transmitting and receiving on 2.4 gigahertz, which is a very busy frequency, but all of the manufacturers have a slightly different way of sending and receiving the data. And every radio, no matter how complex it is, uses the same basic methods to move servos, set the speeds from speed controllers, and tell flight controllers what they need to do. And that connection from the radio receiver that's in the craft up to either the servos that are moving things like gimbals or control surfaces on a plane, or connected into something like a flight controller in a multi-rotor, they're all using the same basic methods. The most basic is something called PWM that we'll talk about in a minute. Now there's a separate video in the Introduction to RC playlist that talks about each of these. I'll put a link in the description. But PWM, Pulse with Modulation, is where you connect one cable for each of the channels. So the ones we've just looked at briefly, the throttle, rudder, elevator, aileron and the auxiliaries or gear switches. The receiver is actually outputting a pulse that's in direct relation to how much of a control you want from that channel. So that is what pulse width modulation stands for. And there's a cable that connects each of those channels on the radio receiver to each of the parts of the model that you need that signal to go to. There's also other ones for PPM, which is where you use a single cable and the receiver very cleverly then puts those values for each of the channels one after the other. And there's also something called SBUS, 
But rather than me getting into too much detail in here, have a look at that other channel if you want to know more about those. Most people these days flying multi-rotors with flight controllers in are using PPM or SBUS. But understanding the basics of how these channels came about and how they're all used will help you build your first models and avoid any mistakes because a common thing that people get wrong is plugging the wrong cable into the wrong channel on the receiver and finding that they're then struggling to calibrate everything on their multi-rotor. We've talked about the fact that each of the radios talks its own language over the 2.4 GHz frequency radio spectrum. And that different language is different for every radio and receiver manufacturer. Now what that means is that you can't buy a receiver that's designed to work with the Futaba and get it working with a Spectrum. And you can't buy a Tyrannus receiver and then expect it to work with something like a Futaba or a Spectrum machine. So you have to buy the receiver that understands the same language as the radio itself. So you'll hear about things called FAST or FAST from Futaba. That's the way that, or the language they talk over the 2.4 gigahertz band. Spectrum has something called DSM, and they also have things like DSM2 and DSMX, which are later versions of it. And then FR Sky and the Tyrannus use things called ACCST. So when you're building your first model, make sure that you have a receiver that will bind to the radio, uh, because if it doesn't speak the same language, it simply won't work. So as we've talked about, most radios will have at least five channels. Some of them will have an awful lot more. And that is because in the early days of remote control, four or five channels were all you really needed. So long as you could make the model move through the sky and control the speed, and maybe you might want um, gears or landing lights, then that was fine. Now new radios have an awful lot more channels. They might have nine, up to potentially 16 or 20 or even more. Why do we need all of those channels? What on earth could we use them for? Because we've already decided that we only need five basic ones to control the basic functions of a model, including multi-rotors. Well, let's have a think about that. So most remote control radios will have five channels, and those five channels are the basics that you really need to fly most models. So that, as we looked at before, is typically aileron, elevator, throttle rudder, and an auxiliary one or a gear switch. Uh, a lot of radios have six channels, so they might have a, another one, they might have a gear and an auxiliary one at the same time, and those are the basics that you need for flight, no matter whether or not we're talking about a plane or we're talking about a multi-rotor. Now you can get planes that don't use ailerons and I'm not considering those for now. We're talking about planes like the little Spitfire that we've looked at that have all of the main control surfaces. So one of the things we need to talk about is why are there so many switches and knobs on a radio transmitter? Why do we need all that stuff if I've just said that we can do with five for basic flight? Well, first of all, we just need to think about what these five channels are actually used for, because sometimes they're referred to as what they make the model do rather than the name that we've been calling them so far. So sometimes you'll hear aileron channel called roll, you'll hear elevator called pitch, throttles usually always called throttle, sometimes called engine or motor, and then rudder is sometimes called yaw, and then the gear or the auxiliary one switch is called mode. And that's because the stuff that's in the parentheses or the brackets on the slide is actually what the control makes the model do. So aileron makes the model roll, or roll from side to side. Elevator makes the model pitch. Now pitch is moving the nose up and down. Similarly with rudder, yaw is where it's actually rotating horizontally, so it's kind of looking left and right. And that can be really confusing for new starters when they're looking at remote control instructions and some people t talk about aileron, some people talking about roll. That's how those two go together. So one of them where we're talking about elevator, aileron, throttle, rudder is talking about the old style channel names, which we still use today because we started out in planes. But we'll look at that in a second. And the second in the parenthesis or brackets is what that channel actually makes the model do. So don't be confused if you're ever stuck, just look at this slide to make the matches.
So the first thing we need to do then is talk about how radios actually work. So what we'll do is we have a little radio receiver here connected to our DX7 and we've powered it from a little battery pack and we've got it connected up to a servo. Now the servo is plugged into the aileron channel. So as I move the aileron control, you can see the servo is moving. And this was how the radio systems were originally designed to be used. So this servo would typically be connected to one of the control surfaces on a model. And as the servo moved, it was pushing or pulling a rod that was connected to one of the control surfaces on a plane. And that control surface was then affecting how the air flew around the plane itself and was making it either pitch, roll, yaw, whatever it was. So if we now just look at that in the diagram form, so here we have our radio on the left hand side sending the radio signal to the aileron channel and as we move the aileron control that signal pulse is being sent down the wire to the servo and the servo is listening to that signal pulse and then hearing what that means and then moving its arm to that position. So that's the basics how it works. But now let's talk about how these channels got their names. So that what we'll do is we'll actually start looking at the plane. So here we've got the graphic. It's nowhere near as pretty as the actual Spitfire model, but it will allow me to kind of show what we're talking about. So if we just go back to the bench, here we are. We've actually now connected the radio up to this model. And what we have done is all of the connections inside the model have already been made for us. But as you can see, as I move something called um, the aileron control, then the controls that are actually moving on the Spitfire are these actually on the back of the wings. One goes up as the other one goes down and vice versa. And what that is making the plane do is actually roll from side to side. So that's why aileron is called roll. Similarly, if we go back and have a look at the model and we move the elevator control, we can now see that the control that's actually being moved is this big long one on the back of the horizontal stabilizer at the very back of the plane. And this control surface job is to make the nose go up or down or to pitch up and pitch down. If we then go and have a look at the next one, so throttle is connected to the motor. And then again, we have the rudder. If we move the rudder channel, then that is connected to the rudder which is on the vertical stabilizer at the back of the model and as that moves from side to side that is actually going to make the model turn left and right and then of course we have a couple of extra switches which on this model aren't actually doing anything um, but they would be maybe connected to the actual gear uh, which would lower or raise the actual gear or landing gear that were underneath the wings so on a standard receiver if I actually get one here, you can see that a lot of the time for the more basic computer radios, it actually has written on what each of the channels are. So if you are wiring up a plane, it gets pretty straightforward. What you do is you actually wire up each of those channels in turn to the servos that are controlling each of those control surfaces, or you're plugging the throttle into your speed controller that's running the motor at the front. Occasionally, you'll find receivers that have numbers on them rather than the names of the channels. And that's because on the radio, typically, you're, you can assign the channels to any one of these numbers. So you can have the aileron control coming out of 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. And all you have to do is just check on your radio how that's configured and make sure you're plugging the aileron control into the number on the receiver that's getting the aileron signal. What about now in the world of multi-rotors? How do we wire that up? Well, we still have the same channel names, we still have the same controls, but now we're actually plugging them into the multi-rotor to actually get it to do roll, pitch, adjust the throttle, and also adjust the yaw or how it's turning. But also the last one as well, auxiliary one or the gear, is now controlling the mode that the flight controller is working in. That might be rate mode, it might be self-level, horizon, or whatever it is. So what we normally do is we normally connect each of those wires together into the flight controller. And this is a very common way to do it, and a way that I started to do it when I first got into remote control and started flying multicopters. Now this means that there is a cable for each of the connections and each of those connections is sending down that pulse that we looked at in the very beginning of the slides for that particular value. The flight controller reads all of those and figures out what you're trying to do.
This is called a PWM connection. So if you hear about PWM, this is what it's talking about, where you have lots of cables going into the flight controller. Or the other way you can connect it is just use one single wire, where, as we talked about at the beginning, a PPM connection is where all signals are sent one after the other into the flight controller. And this makes it really easy to wire up. You typically plug it into whichever the outputs send the PPM connection. So you need to look at the manual for the receiver you're using to figure that out. And once you've done that, tell the flight controller you're using PPM, and suddenly you get all of the channels appearing in the flight controller with just one cable. It's how most of us do it these days when you're wiring up a flight controller. It's much easier to do and much harder to get wrong. So let's go back to talking about the fact that some of these radios have loads and loads and loads of different channels. Why on earth would we need more than five channels? Because we've just looked at it there and it does everything we need it to do on a flight controller. Well it does, but also it doesn't. So here are the first five that we've been looking at. Elevator, aileron, throttle, rudder, auxiliary and gear. And those are typically on the right hand side what they're actually doing on the model. So aileron's making it roll, elevator's making it pitch, etc. So let me add some more channels. So here we have a load more auxiliaries and they're usually called imaginatively auxiliary 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, etc. And here we have 12 channels and they could all be used easily on a multi-rotor model that you might be flying with FPV. So the additional one, you might have auxiliary 2, the switch on that set to be an ODIR switch or the buzzer. Now the ODIR switch might initiate a return to launch where it flies back to you if your flight controller will do that. Or it might sound a nice loud buzzer so you can find the downed craft in the long grass at the edge of the field. Auxiliary 3, you might want to wire that up as LED lights. You might want Auxiliary 4 as landing gear, if you want the landing gear to lift out the way of a gimbal underneath. Auxiliary 5 and 6 might be connected to a head tracker on your FPV goggles, and as you move a head around, it might actually then tilt and pan the camera that's actually mounted on the craft. And then you might want Auxiliary 7 and 8 connected to something like your gimbal tilt and your gimbal pan for a large GoPro that's maybe slung on a gimbal underneath the craft taking beautiful HD images. As you can see, you very quickly, when you start to use more sophisticated models, start to run out of switches. So these bigger radios like the Tyrannus that seem to be bristling with lots of different knobs and switches can get very full very quickly because if you have a kind of craft that has all these extra bits and pieces on it, you are going to start using them. So I started with a DX7 and I thought 7 would be more than enough that I ever needed. However, regularly now I'm using 8 or 9 on the crafts that I'm flying. So hopefully now, us by going through that, you understand a little bit more about radio control. So the channels are actually there because initially we were talking about flying remote control planes. And these days we sometimes refer to it as those old style names, elevator aileron, because those are still what they're called on a lot of the radios. And then sometimes we talk about them as the actual thing they do to the craft, whether they make it pitch, roll, yaw or whatever. Don't get confused, that's how it works. And also now we've talked about the fact that you can connect the radio receiver to the model in lots of different ways. And if you want to know more about that, watch that other video about PPM, SBUS and PWM. It goes into a lot more detail. And we also talked about the fact that all the radios, although they use 2.4 gigahertz, they don't talk the same language. So you need to make sure that any receiver you're buying one has enough channels so that you can plug all the bits into it that you need to, unless you're using PPM or SBUS, and it also will actually connect to and bind or have a connection to the radio that you're actually using. Thank you for taking the time to watch that video. There are lots of other videos on the channel and they're carefully ordered into playlists. So you may find that there are other videos on this same subject that you can go and watch. So I would recommend going into the playlist area of Painless360 YouTube channel and looking around and seeing what there is. You never know what you might find. Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe and happy flying.